introduce you. Our next speaker is Jared McLean from Google, and he will tell us about what the foundations of quantum computer science can teach us about chemistry. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot for the invitation to, to talk about this work. So uh, I feel like I need to start a little bit by giving some context for the actual uh, perspective that I'm gonna talk about. So when I got an invitation sometime last week to talk about this paper in particular uh, to this crowd, I was a little bit surprised because I think it's a bit different uh, if you look into it than <laughs> Some of the other work that's been talked about at this conference, which involves you know, many sophisticated proofs and great results. Uh, whereas this paper, this paper is more of a perspective, more of a high level kind of musing on ideas. And to be honest, its origin was sort of that I was invited to by a chemistry journal uh, to write a perspective about the future of quantum computing and chemistry. And I'd seen probably enough and maybe written my fair share of these papers where we talk about putting a molecule uh, into a quantum computer, uh, we do it much faster, do everything we'd like to do. And you know, three or four months later, we're all in a solar punk utopia. That's not to say I don't believe in the power of quantum computing for chemistry, but I wanted to use this opportunity to kind of share a recent perspective that I'd gained, which was something about the power of data and how that affects what we think about physical simulation. So if you look at this author list, you'll notice that it's a pretty strong collection of chemists um, with one bold computer scientist at the end who was willing to, to sign on with our uh, insanity. And basically what we do is try to offer some of this perspective and kind of push in different directions in chemistry and hopefully inspire chemists to look more at com quantum computer science and maybe inspire quantum computer scientists to look a little bit in the other direction as well. <clears throat> so like I said, we don't prove anything new in this paper. I'll reference some results in the middle of this talk um, that are from a different paper that have some proofs associated with them. But I think it'll be a bit different. I hope that it's uh, fun. It will probably be contentious uh, and upset some people that are watching it. But if it inspires one new interesting thought uh, through that window of blind rage, then I'm happy. So with that, I wanted to kind of say, start off by talking a little bit about what simulating chemistry can mean. Um, and so traditionally we talk about uh, taking some structure or some set of reagents. And actually I'm gonna talk about many different parts of chemistry today, not just say electronic structure or dynamics or things like that. Um, and from that, I hope to gain some amount of understanding about that molecule. So say how it absorbs light, how it complexes with other species. Maybe I'd like to know how to reach that molecule from some set of reagents. Uh, and if I can understand aspects of it, then I get some element of control. If I know why molecules absorb light, uh, then I can start to design better photovoltaics. If I know why they complex with other species, maybe I can understand chemical reactions a bit better, or I can start to inhibit reactions that I don't want and guide evolutions, or I can get platinum out of my catalytic converters finally, uh, and try to move towards less expensive metals. And so when we simulate chemistry, what do we typically do versus what we, we could have done? So let's take a scenario, for example, where I'm going to simulate chemistry without reference to the history of chemical simulation. So imagine that I'm basically in a scenario where I have some concept of atoms and molecules, and now I've just uh, received my first computer and someone told me that there are, for example, these uh, things that I'd like to do. I'd like to answer about these molecules. And so what are those questions often? So I end up with some amount of products afterwards and I start to ask myself questions. Perhaps these are my target for what I get out. Like how long does this reaction typically take? Or does this ever actually happen in a realistic uh, scenario or does this product simply never appear? And so I'm going to take my computer without my knowledge of chemistry, and I'm going to basically say, well, someone told me that there's at least these laws of motion, either Newton's dynamics for moving around some classical nuclei in an approximate potential, or this full Schrodinger dynamics where I have seemingly exact Hamiltonian. Um, and sometimes I can just afford to simulate one copy. So what can I do? I can simulate it. I can let these things bounce around. I can wait for a really long time. I can wait for a more time. Have I waited for enough time? I'm not sure. Uh, and I asked, does this product come out? And can I really answer this question? And so I spent a lot of time 
Um, and you kind of start to say, well, maybe this is not the most effective simulation strategy, um, but we have quantum computers these days. And so surely this will, will help me out. And so what's one thing that we can say from what we've learned about the study of quantum computers, even before we've had them uh, available to us, is kind of the limits of what this type of simulation can do. So if I close my eyes, I've learned nothing from nature. I plow forward with dynamics and I hope for the best, what can I learn? Uh, and so basically the setup here is that I have some initial state that I'm interested in. I have a Hamiltonian. It's guided by say the Schrodinger equation. And now I have my quantum computer. I can do these great exact quantum dynamics. And there's been wonderful developments in this area. It's kind of a rapidly developing field where you can get nearly numerically exact evolutions um, in a time that's sort of sublinear in the number of basis functions. So quantum computers are really good at quantum dynamics. Uh, and exact classical competition seems to hit an exponential wall in this area because while ground states were quite good at, kind of arbitrary dynamics seem to not have as much structure as we'd appreciate. Uh, the entanglement truncation is really hard. Things don't go as well as we'd like. And so you can start to look at this. And if you're, say, not steeped in quantum computing, people in chemistry start to believe, well, perhaps uh, this can do almost arbitrary computations. If I speed things up fast enough, then maybe I can actually do what I just said, but faster than nature can do it, and I can still reach interesting answers. And sort of what basically intuition, and I'm going to abuse a, a result a little bit here uh, and talk about that, tells us is that even a quantum computer has limits. Basically, we expect the simulation time of a physical system to be at least some multiple greater than the physical time. The intuitive reason without any theorems is just to say that uh, if a system could simulate itself faster than it ran, then it could sort of recursively do that and do any computation instantly. And I'm leaning a little bit on the no fast forwarding theorem here, which of course is a query complexity result. So it's not directly applicable. You have to add a bunch of caveats to this, um, to what you wanna say, but essentially you wanna say that the field of quantum computer science has already studied to some extent the limits of what such a perfect device can do. And now if I come in and tell you that some chemical reactions with 10 to the 23 molecules before we start to see appreciable reaction rates can take hours, what chance does a single realization of this have with any kind of multiplier where C is greater than one? And so you're looking at this and you say, oh, well, that's not so good. Um, but why are you even talking about dynamics? Like um, for these types of things, doesn't everyone just uh, go to their favorite tried and true electronic structure calculation? And of course, you've, we've seen this slide appear or rather this quote appear many times that basically the underlying physical laws for chemistry are just waiting for us to grab as we solve this kind of time independent Schrodinger equation. And so how did we actually reach this? Why is this a useful perspective? Because if you kind of recall back to your early quantum mechanics courses, uh, the dynamics uh, and the stationary state kind of perspective contain more or less the same information as input. In both cases, you're given a Hamiltonian. In one, you're given an initial state, but essentially, it's usually a hop, skip, and a jump to go from the dynamics picture to stationary states. And it's just asserted to you that these will be the important states for, for reasons you'll understand at some point. Um, and why is this a useful perspective? And I'm going to claim that it's because we have additional information that we sort of got from the outside world. One piece of information uh, is, for example, that this is limited to physical time scales, while on the other hand, uh, the world is not actively exploding, though it's funny, as I was making this slide, a wildfire broke out uh, <laughs> across the river from me, and I debated maybe I should take the burning globe off the slide, but we persist nonetheless. And so thermodynamics is often predictive of long-time behavior because things tend to have enough time to settle into states where T going to infinity, so this thermodynamic limit, is predictive of a long time scale uh, that I actually care about. So of course there are limits to this. For example, no living things are at thermodynamic equilibrium. The Boltzmann's dog is a great example of this, but often these stationary states also have the additional structure that they're well approximated more so than the dynamics 
And so by making an approximate answer to the infinite time limit, I seem to be able to jump the line on these physical time scale constraints. And so I make predictions on time scales that are much beyond this fast forwarding limit. And we know, of course, there are no free lunches. Um, thermo can't be better for all systems. Um, are physical systems special? I think this gets to some of the questions that Brian was asking. And in the worst cases, you expect to sort of have to enumerate all of your states um, or diagonalize, but is this actually a useful perspective? And I'm going to, to tease on that a little bit. But before I do, I'm gonna make the chemical problems a little bit, start to make them a little bit harder. Um, and so we've talked a lot of our course about thermodynamics in the sense that these stationary states are predictive because we look around in our world and we notice that we're at some temperature and for electronic temperature time scales or for electronic te temperature scales, this often means we're very close to or entirely in the ground state. So this means I can predict something about my long time behavior if I can wait long enough. Um, but in some cases, so for example, I'll go into a laboratory, I'll have some set of chemical reagents, each of these spheres you can just uh, believe is some chemical that I got out of my uh, Sigma Aldrich catalog and I put them into a vial and I'd like to say, which of these two products uh, do I get more of? Um, one in fact has much lower energy than the other according to some very accurate calculation I did. But you talk to your friend uh, who actually went and did the experiment and they've never seen the top one in any experiment they've ever done. Um, and that's because if you just talk about sort of these ground states on their own, they aren't really predictive of the rates at which things happen. Um, and so we try to shoehorn some of this back into chemistry um, by instead of just doing the thermodynamics of stable nuclear configurations, trying to identify paths and do the thermodynamics of these paths. Uh, but we often have already injected some amount of classical observational information, which is gonna be a kind of recurring theme throughout this talk that allows this to be kind of a good analysis. Why should it take one dominant path? Why is this a good approximation? Should it take all of them? If I were to include the nuclei, for example, into my quantum calculation. So all of my nuclei here, are, of course, classical under this Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Um, if I made them quantum, how would I actually start to, to do this calculation? Um, in fact, this pre-information of keeping things in a nuclei classical has more value than perhaps you might imagine as an approximation. So if you actually try to go make all of your nuclei quantum, you've in principle made everything more accurate, so you should be happy. But what you might be left with is a bit of a nuclear electron soup. So things that are sort of degenerate for other reasons, you might get superpositions of them. It can be hard actually to go back and find molecules after you've lost them in the soup. You have other problems like center of mass translation modes are now good eigenstates or near good eigenstates. So this can become problematic as well. And in fact, uh, keeping it real can go quite wrong for examples that are incredibly simple. So take for example, uh, hydrogen chloride, just an HCl, a uh, strong acid that you might use in many different experiments. And if I make everything quantum, uh, no one's ever shown me the outside world. I just take my uh, quantum soup out of it and start doing my calculation. I have the Schrodinger equation, everything's perfectly exact. And I realize, uh, and my solutions also realize that because this diatomic molecule, so has this rotational symmetry, my solution should uh, respect that symmetry also. So I do this calculation and what I find depicted by one sphere, it's sort of a chlorine atom enveloped by a sphere of hydrogen. And now I do my dipole moment calculation and I find that it's zero. Great, I've learned wonderful physics, but then someone comes along and tells me that they've pinned the classical nuclei, uh, which is of course, as we've talked about now wrong because it doesn't have the right symmetry. I do a calculation and get one to buy uh, which is some unit of dipole moment that chemists like to use. And then someone does an experiment and it matches this wrong model perfectly. So of course, this is an example of spontaneous symmetry breaking, but how would I have known this without some sort of data from the outside world to help me out with this calculation? So in this case, the more correct quantum answer was not actually what I was looking for. I was looking for the additional knowledge that in fact, every realization of this molecule that we've seen in a lab is symmetry broken by some external environment. So what can we say about the predictive power of free energies? And this sort of is a preamble uh, to the next part. So 
for example, what have we learned recently about certain parts of models in physics uh, related to computational hardness? So we've seen, for example, that we can't fast forward things very far. We've seen that perhaps you can enumerate all these states though, and then take some reduced number like a thermodynamic free energy and try to use that predictively. And I think interestingly, a thing that we can contribute or rather computer scientists who have proven these things can contribute is that some questions which seem very reasonable and actually I think are quite applicable, like does a system ever thermalize? Does a system have an electronic gap, some large limit? Will molecule X ever form from constituents Y are in fact undecidable. And so as a mere mortal chemist, I spent a long time trying to wrap my head around this, like what this could possibly mean. And then I found this nice paper by Chris Moore where he tried to put undecidability into a physical context. And this is kind of the definition that I lean on to make some of these analogies, even though you might find it a little bit uh, grating if you try to go to a formal extent. And what that says is that physical undecidability, and I'm paraphrasing a bit, as a system evolves forward in time, there are sudden qualitative changes that cannot be predicted in any way except evolving it forward in time and seeing if it happens. And no answer in finite time can indicate that it will never happen. So something happening here would be like the halting of a halting problem. And so you can say, okay, well, we already had hard enough time relating you know, finite complexity theory results. Why are we going to, to bring in this kind of undecidability questions? And I'm gonna lean on this kind of old but useful quote, uh, <laughs> all models are wrong, but some are useful. And so if we consider these physical systems that, for example, I'm going to look at the problem of chemical synthesis. So in this case, I'm going to have some box of reagents and I could just keep adding more if I need to add more. Um, and I'm going to ask, does this molecule on the right ever come out? And we suspect that the universe is finite. So you're very tempted to then say, well, at least formally, I can box up the entire universe into a set of discrete possibilities. There'll be some size at which I don't need to add more reagents. So I just choose that size and I start doing all these combinatorial calculations of free energy or some analog for it and say, okay, now that I found this one has the lowest free energy, I can say that it will eventually show up. Um, and what I want to say is you can take that perspective. You can enumerate and tell me about the exponentially small probabilities and compare, but it doesn't seem actually as close of a match to what you would see, for example, if you went into a, a lab or really thought about the complexities of emerging chemical systems, basically. Real systems can in fact continue to borrow from the environment. Sometimes they have these side reactions, which lock them in states that mean for the foreseeable future, not only will you not go back to uh, thermodynamic equilibrium, but you'll freeze so exactly, perhaps the system actually is physically transported away from the original. Um, and I think there's a, a lot of value in which to just say that instead of distracting yourself with this kind of combinatorial point of view, you can sort of embrace that there is some element of this unpredictability and this problem statement. And this will be not just a defeatist attitude, but I think one that actually leads to a constructive method for kind of thinking about this. And just some of the ways in which this tends to happen in practice, or for example, like I mentioned, side reactions where one reaction is simply much faster than another. You lead down a chain of them, you get to a pretty stable state, and just practically you never see uh, the rest come. And I think this is also an argument that I'll make later, but these uh, autocatalytic cycles of Kaufman where life kind of emerges via this scheme where things self-catalyze, it's very hard to tell exactly what size that's going to happen at. And so where have we seen hints of this in physics? So it's always very tempting in chemistry. Chemistry feels very finite, feels very discrete. Uh, rarely do we take these infinite limits except for certain thermodynamic problems. But in physics, people love taking in uh, to infinity, usually as a simplification, this kind of thermodynamic limits. And in analogy to that HCL problem we had before, we already have some instances where you take this limit, n goes to infinity, uh, and you have to do kind of a by hand correction. So if you just take a 2D ferromagnet icing model um, and you start looking at, you know, it's symmetric, it could be all spin up, all spin down. If I look at its thermodynamics without doing anything, I would conclude basically that 
uh, the two lowest degenerate states might have equal occupation. And if you just plow forward, you can end up with some, some strange results basically. Um, but we fix this by saying, oh no, there's spontaneous symmetry breaking. In fact, there's not some exponential probability that the infinite system you know, will flip or something like this at zero temperature. We just exactly fraction it into one part of space. And we give this a special term, we call it spontaneous symmetry breaking. But when this happens, because of, not because of symmetry, but because of something else, we have to invent a different term for it. Um, so in free energy landscapes of spin glasses, we also take this n goes to infinity limit and we start to see with these strong potential landscapes that the real physics of the system is described by being locked into some glassy state. And as we take this n goes to infinity limit, we're not counting exponentially small probabilities in some distant basin. We're in fact saying this new Gibbs measure, not to be confused with the Gibbs state, exactly describes the system that I'm, I'm interested in. And so this game we've played before where we use a little bit of external data to kind of say that, okay, this combinatorial view wasn't really the one I wanted. I'm going to use some information uh, to help myself out a little bit. And just to make this uh, talk a little bit memorable, uh, let's take one mo even more extreme example, perhaps, of where kind of this undecidability can come about. So it is, of course, a big open question how, uh, you know, you take small reagent molecules like ethanol, methane, et cetera, and these tend to combine and to make things like proteins, uh, which are then catalysts of themselves. And in fact, even the order of the arrows that I'm showing now is highly contentious. And this can lead to the emergence of say DNA, which can act as both a mechanist and a information carrier. And eventually you get to something like an animal cell. And so each one of these feels like very great qualitative changes. And even after I get to the point of animal cell, I can ask you a question like, Do hu does human life ever emerge? I try to answer this question and then I see a dinosaur come out and I say, okay, well, I'm tempted to say no. And then suddenly a meteor strikes and we have reemergence of human life. And so certainly this is not a proof but despite connections of DNA computing to undecidability. But if you embrace this kind of philosophical point of view that this might be useful, um, which you'll hopefully be more convinced of in a minute, these certainly feel like qualitative changes that are very hard to predict ahead of time without actually just running it forward and seeing what happens. So why am I spending all this time being such a, a downer? Why am I telling you that there are these things which you can't have algorithms to, to compute? And my argument is actually that while this won't be a perfect analogy, um, there is this kind of concept, uh, at least in formal computer science that I was taught about by some of my collaborators, that undecidability can formally be broken by advice in some cases. And something we showed later is that data is actually a restricted form of advice. And so this was kind of this conceptual epiphany that I had, that in fact, data that came from our universe um, is a little bit more powerful than we thought it was. I won't claim that it will solve undecidable problems. That's not the point, this is sort of just inspiration, but let me take you perhaps on a small detour that will help you convince you that this is at least very relevant in all of our considerations of the hardness of quantum problems. So let's take a very brief uh, detour here. So this will be the section that uh, at least alludes to some result in another paper, which is new, uh, rather than simply a conceptual overview. So I'm going to take a brief detour to this Hartree-Fock experiment that we did. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail other than to say, I want you to notice the circuit on the top left. It, is, it works on these n qubits. It's a series of these rotations. And the most important thing to remember from at least this point is that this is a circuit which is easy to evaluate classically. Um, we know more or less everything about it. Uh, and it's a nice starting point for adding more correlation and adding uh, more and more complexity to a quantum circuit so that you can get better and better descriptions of things. And it's been at least useful in some cases to consider these circuits that have uh, each of these angles in them. We could maybe train these angles or parameterize them to fit some problem that we're interested in to kind of squint a little bit and consider these like neural networks that we can use to learn. And so there's in fact an enticing connection with the classical community. So there were these problems with vanishing gradients, especially in very long circuits in say recurrent neural networks and some a group of uh, 
machine learning experts came up with these potential solutions to it called efficient unitary neural networks. In fact, the first iterations were these unitary neural networks and the efficient ones, if you look at them, are actually exactly the uh, implementations you might be looking for, um, but I'll mention that in a second. Um, these work by feeding things into unitaries, doing a nonlinearity, so you don't just collapse the whole thing, doing another unitary, doing a nonlinearity. And in fact, the efficient version is exactly the hartree fock gibbons rotations that chemists have been doing for quite some time. And so you look at this and you're like, okay, well, this is a great opportunity if I'm interested in the way that data influences the hardness of problems to come in and bring in a, a quantum computer and just take an existing working machine learning model and just plug in a quantum device. So I'd like to, to boost the power with quantum since I already have this great efficient reference point and I know I can add quantum things to it to make it more and more powerful. So the classical case has N inputs and N outputs. Um, and a natural choice, since we're talking about chemistry, is to just use these fermionic occupation modes. And since especially these efficient unitary neural networks are exactly single particle uh, fermionic rotations. And I'm going to beef up the power of quantum with some new generators. So here's the circuit that I had. Here's the effective dimension at the bottom. So right now it's just hard to fuck. Everything's kind of rotating in just n dimensions. All the rest of my states aren't that important. Um, but now I'm going to add some particles. I'm going to interact them. I'm going to loop this construction many, many times. I'm going to make this a very hard circuit. It can probably do arbitrary computation. And then I'll destroy some particles or just measure and renormalize and I'll have N at the end. So I've taken N inputs. I've done blown things up into this exponential space, done arbitrary computation, and then I've read out N outputs. So I've clearly revolutionized uh, machine learning and I'm gonna press forward and see how this works. So we're doing a learning problem. So let's let our model have a little bit of data as a treat. So I'm gonna take in some data here. I'm just gonna call it XI and YI. And these XI here will be these pieces of data that come in as my N inputs, which I've relabeled P to keep you on your toes. Uh, and now I have this long quantum neural network U, which I allow to be of totally arbitrary length. And I have this Hermitian operator O in the middle that's going to correspond to my outputs. And as long as I give myself ancilla, this is in fact, I can make an arbitrary computation in here. And so direct simulation must be at least as hard as BQP. And because it's infinite length, it's probably harder. Uh, and I wanna look at what my outputs actually look like. So I take my N inputs, I take this operator O, and I simply expand it out, I do a little math, and I have this matrix BKL, which I've told you is basically as hard to compute as uh, doing anything in quantum computation. But this is at most a quadratic function of XI with P squared coefficients. And basically what's happened here is that with no data, this is a hard quantum circuit, and with a quadratic amount of data, this is almost a trivial learning task. And so this is kind of the start of a realization because this was kind of the trivial case of what happens if you're just kind of input and output dimensions are constrained in the wrong way. And you're like, wait a minute, there seems to be an issue here where having a little bit of data has fundamentally changed the complexity of this task. And this was kind of the quest, uh, the problem that set us off on a quest. Um, and I mentioned that my collaborator, Robert Huang did almost of the hard computer science work here where in fact, he was able to show that there is a different complexity class where you are endowed with the power of data that comes from a quantum computer. And this allows a classical learning algorithm with a little bit of data to solve problems that previously only a quantum computer could solve. And so for me, this was like a big conceptual uh, revelation, even if one that's like a little bit against uh, you know, this idea that quantum is strictly more powerful. And so I won't talk about the proof here, but just to say that this was an inspiring uh, point for me and one that I had hoped to share both with the chemical community and otherwise. And so in fact, if you look towards a problem like chemical synthesis, you can't help but start to notice hints of where we've made choices based on say input and data. So I mentioned this very hard problem of, of synthesizability. Um, there is this whole field called natural product synthesis, where you take a, a very hard, you take some molecule from nature, um, often which has some nice property. I think the one that I depicted here um, has some anti-cancer properties. Um, and then you ask, how do you best make this from simple reagents that I can order off the shelf? 
And one of the big questions that it actually answers is, was this molecule synthesizable at all? Um, so if you talk to people that are in, uh, for example, screening projects where you try to design new molecules and test properties and do many, many different iterations of say, new photovoltaics or new drugs or things like that, um, you'll find that a nearly universal problem that they have is they reach the final list of candidates, the properties all check out, they go deliver these candidates to a, a chemist. Uh, the chemist looks at them and says, I don't think you can make any of these. Um, no one knows how to synthesize them. Then a PhD student goes off, spend five years trying, never succeeds. And sort of, we don't really have a single property that we know how to compute on a molecule that tells us if it's synthesizable. But what we do have is data from the natural world that suggests certain pieces are more synthesizable than others by virtue of common side reactions, kinetics, thermodynamics, and things like that. And often chemists are very good sources of just glancing at a molecule and knowing if you can make it or not. And to me, this idea that you could take instead of this combinatorial perspective of say, I took this molecule at the left, blew it up into its atoms, rearranged them aggressively, and tried to do calculations to say if any of these things were, were potential uh, synthesis routes. Or I can take the point of view on the right, this undecidable point of view, which is to say I'm going to take a, a data-driven uh, solution to my problem, and I can look in chemical catalogs and tell you have these large fragments ever been produced and how. Um, and this might be a more viable route to this problem. And then as if one blow wasn't enough, uh, the same author and collaborators uh, went on to show a different result, which he talked about at this conference, which was that in fact, for certain systems in condensed matter physics with a little bit of data, you can now sort of provably solve nearby problems. And they go on to do numerics and show that in fact, you can do often even better than this in several phases at the same time. And so this inspires a question of, well, Chemistry is a little more discrete than some condensed matter systems. Adding one or two molecules to the system can, or one or two atoms can cause dramatic property changes, like it might not be soluble in water anymore or things like this. This isn't really a phase change in the traditional definition in physics, but it's a very discrete and very dramatic uh, change to a system. And if all of these results turn out to be true, while it will be very useful to use a quantum computer to build learning models, uh, that can very accurately predict chemistry. If the fate of quantum computers in chemistry is to provide training data for classical models, I think we'd all be a little bit disappointed for one of the most exciting and fundamental technologies that humanity's ever tried to work on. Um, but luckily, uh, the same author in a different one at uh, the same time uh, dropped another result, which is still along the lines of what you can do with data on a quantum computer. Um, and so I believe that uh, at least one of these was talked about at this conference. Um, but basically this result said that if you had uh, a quantum computer and you could bring in quantum states instead of just measurements about them, there was in fact some things a quantum computer could allow you to learn about the universe, which would, would require exponentially more samples than that classical case. And so if I'm following this theme that data from the natural world is in fact not only powerful like a quantum computer, but one that's run for a very long time, uh, and that this is a very powerful concept I should take forward. What I've now learned is that quantum computers can help me learn about that, those results much, much faster in some cases. And so this kind of brings back your, your optimism and you start to feel like, okay, maybe this is where I should be looking for the new frontiers. And so what does that kind of look like? I should say that in this perspective, we have a transition point where we start to speculate about the future and that's kind of where we're at now um, and so hopefully you'll enjoy some of these musings but they're they're not so concrete and so you have to imagine a future with multi-qubit quantum data to really see these these advantages and so chemical systems should interact with some quantum sensor you can either do direct measurements which is what we do today like destructive measurements and process but what we've learned from these recent papers and in some cases as few as two copies or a few copies um, that transduction in this quantum computer lets us make predictions or store records of these systems with exponentially fewer copies. And so it's kind of interesting because in my mind, it flips a bit the narrative of quantum sensing. Uh, traditionally, when you talk about quantum sensing, you talk about learning perhaps a single phase with one qubit or many 
qubits that form an effective like large GHC state to increase sensitivity. But that's usually like a kind of quadratic ish speed up and turning up the brightness of your light can, can kind of overcome this sometimes. But what these results are saying is that transduction of multi qubit states are exponentially more powerful. And I think we need to think more about what that might mean for the future of sensors. For example, chemists are some of the first to embrace, you know, these original quantum sensors of NMR, but these are usually kind of effective single qubit DQC1 like uh, sensors. And there might be some hope in say spatially resolved diamond sensors or perhaps zero field. This is again, wild speculation. And I think it's always fruitful to look at some untapped technology in quantum computing within chemistry. So for example, the technology in error correction and Clifford states can express some almost very powerful entanglement structures, but the ones that are efficient to simulate and easy to combine with these kind of Hartree-Fock rotations after the fact. So you can do at least as well as Hartree-Fock. And there is some at least tantalizing connection for something that can be expressed as graph states and molecules, which have this very natural graph expression to them. And as an untapped additional question, does this part which makes transition metal catalysts hard to simulate, which is this quasi-degeneracy of Slater determinants, relate in any way to the ways in which error correcting codes uh, protect information through degeneracy? I'm not sure, but certainly that's a fun uh, part to probe. And kind of last uh, but not least of these kind of additional things one might use is that we have this large history of quantum control in chemistry. And I think that, you know, what we do now is we do these measurements and we do these feedback loops, sort of analog control. And what we learned from say a bit of quantum error correction is that in fact, some of these measurements don't need to be destructive. If you have some quantum probe in the system, you can start to do measurements that not only create, preserve entanglement, but actually create it and allow you to say, start stabilizing exotic quantum states in your chemical system, perhaps that help catalyze different pieces of it. And finally, if we could really loop in this digital connection where we now can get to these kind of provable error correction regimes, what does that mean for the stabilization of exotic chemistry states like excitons or polariton couplings, maybe strong cavity chemistry? And again, this is just some things that I feel chemists might have overlooked in the development of, say, um, quantum error correction, but I feel like could make an interesting backport. And so taking back another look at computational chemistry as kind of a brief summary of what we've talked about. I've argued in a very hand wavy way that many problems in design synthesis and biology feel like undecidable problems. This is not a proof. What can we say about the way that data from nature helps us and whether this perspective is not perhaps correct, but is a useful perspective. Um, data from quantum computers can lift classical machine learning above its direct simulation competition. What can quantum simulation data actually do for chemistry? How can we, we start to use this uh, knowledge to better plan for the future? Is the fate of quantum computers largely to provide data? Uh, I certainly hope not. Um, but how do we start to look towards sensors in the future where this can be true? And are there any untapped tools from quantum computing that can help chemistry before a full quantum computer? And so maybe you'd like at least one tagline before we end, which is to say that we had this bold question, what the foundations of quantum computer science teach us about chemistry. And I was referring largely to these recent results that say that uh, data is more powerful than we think it is. And I think what we can learn uh, from quantum computers is hopefully uh, how to access the natural world in an even more uh, important and aggressive way, I'll say. And with that, I'd just like to thank all of the collaborators who were involved in this work those were brave enough that to uh, be on this paper where we did some wild speculation. And I hope that you at least found the discussion a bit fun and engaging, um, even if you disagree with some of the points that I've made. And I'd like to thank you all for listening. Thanks. Thanks up for questions. I have a question. So, uh, is there uh, anything you can say about how that uh, complexity class, I forget what it was called, uh, was it slash? Which one? So, you're referring to say like the BPP SAMP class? Yeah, yeah. So, BPP SAMP. So, can you say anything about how that compares to having like 
just like an oracle to a quantum algorithm? Uh, so I suppose I'm probably the wrong person to answer this question, but the setting, it might be similar, for example, to having access. Mm, no, actually, that's not true. Uh, so one of the problems we examine in the appendix of the, the paper is one in which, uh, say in this setting, you can imagine problems in which you get, get some training data and now the classical machine learning algorithm only needs to embed your data using a classical computer. So it can still, it doesn't have access to a quantum Oracle but it's still now as powerful as some quantum tasks. But there are other tasks where the embedding actually needs to be a quantum embedding. And this is kind of these factoring like problems. So in that case, that would probably be more close to the setting you're thinking of where I have access to a quantum Oracle while I'm in the prediction phase. So I think they're maybe distinct in that sense. There's a question in the Q&A. Um, do you have any findings about the digital analog interfaces, techniques such as DQC1 complexity and sensors? Uh, so I don't have any results myself. I can point interested people to uh, problems where people have studied NMR, uh, sort of the, the measurement of NMR signals in the context of DQC1, I think maybe uh, I'm forgetting the, there was two or three papers, but if people remind me or I have time after, I can paste them into the, the chat. Basically, the, the feeling is that you're getting an essentially classical signal out from coupling to this quantum one. Um, and the quantum, when you're doing NMR, because spin spacings are so close, are so close together, um, you can essentially view it as an infinite temperature thermal state, and yet you still extract information from time-time correlations on that thermal state. Um, but I can point people to the papers, but I don't personally have any new results on that. Um, that, that was a really nice talk, Jared. Uh, so I have a quick question. Uh, um, you know, you spoke about collecting this quantum data or through transducing. So is that something I should think of as being easy to do or is that in principle something to do? So once you create, am I, am I thinking correctly that you, you once you, once you create this chemical molecule, you want to actually do measurements on it, and these are now general quantum measurements or something, or you want to take that as an input to a quantum computer. So is that is that something that's how, how should I think of the complex, you know, feasibility? Yeah. So in in terms of practical complexity, I think um, this kind of depends on the problem, the setup, and what you want to learn a little bit. Maybe I'll give a few examples. So. Uh, really to see these huge advantages in learning um, as was done in some of these follow-up papers, you want it to be multi-qubit quantum information and you'd like it to be about the molecule. In a, in a perfect world, you could say, transduce the state of the molecule into the quantum computer, but that's obviously um, not really feasible, probably even from a physical perspective. Um, and so you would imagine attaching uh, say nitrogen vacancies and diamond like an array of them so that you can get correlated spatial uh, information as well as the quantum information. Um, but in this setup, you then need to get it into a computational medium where you can at least do, do Clifford gates on it. And so I would say at the moment, the state of multi-qubit quantum sensors that can do this is somewhat limited for chemistry, but I do feel that um, some systems are a bit better adapted to this point of view than say the superconducting qubits we use. So it's not uncommon right now to build quantum sensors out of say very elaborate setups with atom interferometry. So those atoms are already, single atoms are already very good sensors of something like gravitational fields or um, other signals. Uh, and if you can advance at the same time your ability to compute in atoms, then you no longer have this transduction problem. So you go out and you use your atom fountain to do uh, some type of measurement. You store that quantum state in the atoms. And now it's also your computational medium. So you don't have to do any kind of transduction to, to accomplish this. I should say that if you need to do substantial computation, you also need to do an encoding step and do an error correcting code. But this is kind of counted as the fidelity of transduction. And I don't think you need to have perfect fidelity to do that, but once you've done it, you can go on. So if you're in a system like atoms or ions, I think you might already be not that far from a multi-qubit quantum system, 
that can both be a sensor and a computer. If you're in a system like superconducting qubits and your target is an atom or molecule, then you kind of need to go through a chain of steps. And I believe that's quite far from realization. But what these most recent results tell me is that you know, these strong query complexity results don't permit as much classical competition as all the problems we're having with making ground states. And so I think this helps motivate the development of that kind of sensor because um, maybe I'm rambling too much, but I used to be very much closer to chemistry labs themselves. And people in these labs looked at quantum sensing for a little while and they concluded that because of the brightness of sources and the quadratic at most speed up, it wasn't a great use of their time. But if there was an exponential speed up, I feel like that attitude might change. And so, yeah. All right, a couple more questions in the um, Q&A. Would you see an application of quantum computers in the digital plus analog to quantum chemistry go beyond data from QC? Let's see, would you see an application of quantum? analog data from quantum computers. So maybe that's asking um, if you do some kind of digital analog simulation, does this have uh, value beyond producing data? Or maybe the question is, can this do things you can't do with just uh, collected data? And I maybe answering the second supposition of that question first is that the provable results sort of pertain to at least so far data often within a same phase, which is where properties tend to change somewhat slowly. So prediction via extrapolation is somewhat reliable. Once you cross phase boundaries or do strange things with chemicals, sometimes properties change almost discontinuously. Um, and so I'd say in that case, having access to the quantum computer, so long as you can then prepare new things in a different phase that had no data still has value, of course. But once you have a lot of data in each of those phases, I think what these results suggest is that with not that much data, um, that might be good for those systems. The most value in the system is in bringing you data from new ones. And I think that's kind of a challenge for analog simulators since they're built for one particular type of system. Last question, uh, was it stated that leaving or writing information influenced chemistry? You see that question there? Was it stated that reading or writing information influenced chemistry? Um, I'm not sure exactly what that question means, but I do think information theory has positively influenced chemistry. It's used in a number of number of areas, um, but I'm not exactly sure what that means. All right, well, let's thank Jared again. Great, thank you. <laughs>